Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick revision of John Donne's selected poems. So today we're going to be taking a look at Aaron Angels and we'll have a quick read through. Twice or thrice had I loved thee before I knew thy face or name. So in a voice, so in a shapeless flame, angels affect us oft and worshipped be. Still when, to where thou wert I came, some lovely glorious nothing I did see. But since my soul, whose child love is, takes limbs of flesh, and else could nothing do, more subtle than the parent is, love must not be, but take a body too. And therefore, what thou wert and who, I bid love ask, and now that it assume thy body, I allow and fix itself in thy lip, eye and brow. Whilst thus to ballast love I fought, and so more steadily to have gone, with wares which would sink admiration, I saw I had love's pinnace overfraught. Every thy hair for love to work upon is much too much, some fitter must be sought, for nor in nothing nor in things extreme and scattering bright can love in here. Then, as an angel, face and wings of air, not pure as it, yet pure doth wear, so thy love may be my love's sphere. Just such disparity as twixt air and angels' purity, twixt women's love and men's, will ever be. So Dunn's understanding of angels would have been derived from the writings of Thomas Aquinas. He claimed that angels are intellectual creatures composed of pure spirit. They had no bodies or corporeal form, and they certainly didn't have wings or anything that we would imagine. So to interact with the world, angels had to form bodies out of air. The idea being that uh, angels were so rarefied that in order to interact with the physical realm, they would need to have a medium through which to interact. And air is more rarefied than the physical realm, but not quite as rarefied as the spiritual realm of angels. So it provides that kind of happy medium. Dunn presents the paradoxical notion of love existing before seeing his beloved for the first time. And that could be a reference to the platonic ideal of love. He experiences love in an idealised form before witnessing the actual object of this love. So he has this concept of his idealised love. And then when he sees her, he recognises, ah, she's actually matching that ideal. Dunn clarifies his meaning for a simile that suggests that his love can be based on something unseen in the same way that angels are worshipped and affect us despite being unseen. And the influence of the angels is compared to a voice uh, and a shapeless flame, things that are intangible, things that are ephemeral, yet both significant and influential. You'll notice that there's a frequent use of sibilance here, so, voice, so, shapeless, and that could replicate the gentle yet powerful influence of the angels or love. State still when to where thou wert I came, some lovely glorious nothing I did see. So when he describes his beloved, he sees some lovely glorious nothing, which um, doesn't sound particularly flattering. It's paradoxical as well to describe nothing using adjectives that presuppose existence. But we could resolve that paradox through the recognition that the nothing refers to nothing visible. He encounters his love, something lovely and glorious, but not something tangible. He's almost distancing love from the physical. Dunn then moves on to present a quite complex argument. But since my soul, whose child love is, takes limbs of flesh, and else could nothing do, more subtle than the parent is, love must not be, must take a body too. So the first premise is that given that love is a thing of the spirit, it's a product of the soul. Second premise, that the soul must assume a physical form to interact with the world. And finally, the conclusion, love must assume a physical form to interact with the world. So we can see where Dunn's going with this. The personified love manifests itself in the body of the beloved, allowing the poetic voice to recognise the object of his affection in thy lip, eye and brow. Dunn introduces the conceit of a ship to represent love in physical form. We get this semantic field of sailing with ballast, wares, sink and pinnace, which we'll have a look at in a moment. Um, 
Dunn's basically suggesting that his lover's physical body could provide a kind of tangible vehicle for love. It would be the receptacle of love. The poetic voice initially hopes that uh, love incarnated will allow it to sail steadily with the ballast of physical form providing its support. He goes on to claim that um, identifying the physical form with love could make it sink under the weight of admiration. It's superficial and easily subject to succumbing to the waves of life. He's overfraught or overloaded the pinnace, the small boat, by ascribing love to the purely physical realm. And this is done doing his usual antics of uh, using some kind of homophonic pun that ends up being a penis gag. Um, so he's, uh, he's punning on the, the noun pinnace, which is a small boat for an Elizabethan, but it also has a remarkable phonological similarity to penis. And so it could be an allusion to the purely physical nature of this kind of love. He moves on to um, more consideration of the physical. Uh, the physical places too many demands on love. And this hyperbolic reference to every hair suggests the sheer volume of areas that love must inhabit if it's to be incarnated. Dunn suggests that an alternative must be sought. Love can't be found in the nothing of the spiritual or the angelic, but nor can it be found in the physical things. There has to be an alternative. And so he's setting up this paradox that really he's got to try and resolve for nor in nothing, nor in things. So it's not in nothing and it's not in something. So where on earth can it be? He uses enjambment to develop the reference to things. The extreme and scattering bright suggests the attractive qualities of the physical. And just as an angel requires air to manifest itself, something pure but not as pure as the angel itself, so a woman's pure love is required for man's love to exist. Woman's love is metaphorically compared to the sphere, with Dunn's love or the man's love represented as the angel that inhabits it. And so we have this kind of hierarchy that's established, um, but the two need to coexist. They are symbiotic. Just as there's a difference or disparity between the purity of air and angels, there is this difference between the love of men and women, according to Dunn. But they've got to exist together in order for love to exist in the world. So let's have a look at it structurally. In terms of the rhyme scheme, A, B, B, A, B, A, C, D, C, D, D, E, E, E. So it's a pretty regular rhyme scheme uh, with really strong rhymes, but it's slightly irregular, perhaps representing the poetic voice's uncertainty regarding the nature of the love, um, the amount of focus on the physical versus the spiritual. In terms of the stanza structure, we've got two 14 line stanzas and that division into two could represent the poem's focus on the duality of love. We've had air and angels, angels and the spheres, and ultimately the love of men and women. The 14 lines of each stanza could render the stanzas as sonnets, although they don't conform to Shakespearean or Petrarchan forms of sonnets. Uh, the Elizabethan use of the sonnet as a form of love poem may once again, though, complement the central theme. OK, thanks ever so much, folks. Take care. Cheers.